Hello, everyone, and welcome to our inaugural, inaugural Current Policy Topics event, part of the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research's Citizen Series. Today, we'll be talking about the Fair Elections Act and the implications of the bill for Canadians. My name is Robert Ermel, and I'm the Director of Operations for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. MIPR seeks to enhance public policy discourse in Manitoba by nourishing dialogue and debate on current and emerging issues facing Manitobans and their governments. We do this by engaging with governments, non-governmental organizations, businesses, citizens, and academics to support public policy discussions and deliberations in the broadest sense. The Citizen Series is a community engagement pillar of MIPR. The series seeks to bring policy and political issues to the broader community in an accessible format by bringing together content experts, policymakers, and practitioners on these issues. We hope to stimulate dialogue with our audience members and the online community. The event today is recorded. We do not record the question and answer portion. Current policy topic events are designed to address emergent policy issues and areas that are of immediate concern to Manitobans and Canadians. Bill C-23, the Fair Elections Act, has generated controversy over the past few weeks due to the significant changes it proposes to the Elections Act. The issues that have been raised by the media and politicians warrant critical discussion, particularly the ramifications of this important piece of legislation to our democracy. Over the next hour, our distinguished panelists will outline some of the proposals made in Bill C-23 and examine the implications for Canadians and in the participation of citizens in our electoral process. Our speakers this afternoon are Richard Blasco, Dr. Paul Thomas, and Dr. Royce Coop. Moderating the discussion will be Paul Vogt, who is currently the Executive in Residence for the Manitoba Institute for Policy Research. Paul has worked extensively in the provincial government as Clerk of Executive Council and Cabinet Secretary and Policy Secretary of Cabinet and the Research Director for the Opposition Caucus. Prior to these positions, Paul taught politics, economics, and philosophy at the Universities of Winnipeg and Manitoba. He did his undergraduate degree at the University of Manitoba and did graduate work at Oxford and Princeton University. Uh, I'll now turn it over shortly to Paul to introduce the rest of the panel. But I want to thank you all for joining us today. And at the end of the discussion, I encourage you to uh, complete the feedback forms that are placed in your chairs. Now we're to Paul, and he'll introduce the rest of the topic and our panelists. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Rob. Uh, is this uh, okay? It is working. Um, that, that lecture was only for Rob, <laughs> and from now on, it'll be a very cozy uh, uh, discussion. Uh, people, our panelists will be allowed to uh, to remain in their places. Um, I'm just going to say a few things and then introduce uh, our, our first panelist, uh, as, as you'll probably know already, but uh, this will become evident as we go along. We have a very distinguished and informed uh, group assembled to discuss the, the changes to this uh, act. Uh, Rob alluded to uh, the contentiousness of the, uh, the legislation, and I don't think that can really be overstated, even though uh, electoral rules are not usually considered to be um, high-profile topics. but. Uh, uh, I will, I'll let uh, our panelists uh, delve into the details of legislation, but just to point to two uh, factors uh, that I think can be kept separate in terms of, uh, of the, you know, the, the causes of the sources of contention. One is the, is the very process by which this piece of legislation is being brought in. Uh, there's a school of thought uh, that when it comes to uh, election laws, uh, there should be added care uh, made, or extraordinary care compared to other legislation. To ensure that there is a high degree of consensus uh, before the changes are brought in, given that uh, all parties must abide by the, uh, the rules and they must seem to be fair. And secondly, I think there has been a convention uh, by which the Chief Electoral Officer is, is consulted extensively. And in fact, since the, the CEO uh, normally uh, issues uh, updates and recommendations on, on the, uh, the enact or the implementation of the Election Act, uh, many times, uh, quite a bit of the content uh, of, of changes actually arises from uh, uh, recommendations of, of the CEO. And uh, in this case, uh, neither of those uh, has, uh, has, has proved to be uh, uh, the approach chosen by the, uh, uh, by the government. That's one source of contention. And of course, as, uh, um, as already alluded to, uh, the, the actual content uh, of, of the changes proposed uh, have, have uh, led to uh, quite a bit of controversy, including, uh, and I think this is fairly extraordinary as well, a, a, a widespread petition um, from political scientists, uh, which appeared in the media today, and, and also um, objections uh, from the chief electoral officer himself, which uh, were, were very detailed um, and unusually sharp in, in the language uh, that was used. 
And as I said, I'll let the panelists uh, talk about uh, some of the, the specific features of, of, the, uh, uh, of the legislation, but uh, this really is a very sweeping act. Uh, it will change the ground rules for the way that uh, elections are carried out in Manitoba, and their Canada, sorry, at the federal level. Uh, it will constrain uh, the chief electoral officer and change the way in which uh, investigations into potential breaches uh, or, or alleged breaches of the act uh, are conducted. And it will make a big difference as well to fundraising and the way in which uh, parties uh, spend their money um, uh, during, during election campaigns. Uh, so it is, it is very significant, um, and, and a lot of the contention, of course, uh, resides in the details. Now, to talk about this, uh, we've assembled uh, uh, set a very distinguished uh, panel, uh, Royce Coop, uh, currently in the Political Studies Department, uh, Paul Thomas, formerly in the Political uh, Studies Department, and Richard Velasco, uh, former uh, Chief Electoral Officer uh, uh, for the province of Manitoba for many years. Uh, I'll introduce uh, the, the last two in, in more detail, but um, Royce Coop, our first panelist, um, is Assistant Professor of Political Studies, uh, as I mentioned. He studies political parties, representation, Canadian politics. He received his PhD from the University of British Columbia in 2009, and before coming to Manitoba, he was Assistant Professor in the Graduate School of Public Policy at Simon Fraser University. Also a Shirk Postdoctoral Fellow at Carleton, the Skeleton Clark Postdoctoral Fellow at, at Queen's University, and the University Postdoctoral Fellow at Memorial University. He is the author of Grassroots Liberals, Organizing for Local and National Politics, and co-editor of Parties, Elections, and the Future of Canadian Politics. His, his research has appeared in journals including American Journal of Political Science, Canadian Journal of Political Science, Canadian Public Policy, and the Journal of Elections, Public Opinion, and Parties. He's currently involved with three Shirk-funded projects exploring the nature and practice of representation at the federal level and in Canadian citizens and e-citizenship in Canada. Royce Coop. Thank you. Uh, do, I, do I have to turn this on? Can you hear me? Oh, great. So Paul, Paul introduced me as, uh, as, as currently a member of the Political <laughs> Studies Department. I'm kind of wondering what you know that I don't. <laughs> <laughs> currently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for today. Uh, so the question I wanted to uh, address in this talk, I was trying to figure out what I could uh, actually contribute to this. Uh, and so the question I want to address is uh, why the Tories are taking the approach that they are to, uh, to reforming electoral administration in Canada. They're taking a beating in the media. Uh, Paul mentioned this, uh, this, this letter that was signed by almost 80, I think 80 academics. Uh, so it raises the question, why are they actually why are they actually taking the approach that they are? There's a, a few good reasons to, to ask and try to answer this question. First, I, I, I know that Paul uh, knows everything that there is to know about this bill, so I didn't think there's much for me to add in that respect. Uh, second, I think it, it's pretty easy to ascribe the worst possible motives to the Tories in this case. Uh, in fact, that might actually be true. It might actually come to pass that that is the case, but I think we want to be a little bit more, a little bit more critical. Uh, and, and finally, in the last few years, I spent a lot of time uh, talking with Tory elites and, and hanging out with them. Hanging out is the non-academic way of saying ethnographic study. I spent a lot of time <laughs> studying these Tory elites, so I'm probably in a good position to uh, discuss and assess some of these motivations that the Tories have. Um, so I think that there are probably three possibilities. The first is optimistic, the second quite pessimistic, the third maybe a middle ground. The first is that this is in fact a, a principled position uh, that the Tories are, key, are, are taking that's in keeping with their, their previous positions. They actually haven't changed. Uh, they're doing what they've, they've kind of made it clear they would do in this situation. The second is that they're engaging in score settling and kind of they're trying to kind of jerry the, gerrymander the rules in, in, in their own favor for the future. And the third is that this actually is a principled Tory approach uh, that actually seeks to limit the power of an agency that I think the Tories think is very much opposed to them. Uh, and so we'll we'll look at those three those three possibilities because we can find evidence supporting all three of these positions. So first, <clears throat> it's a principal position. Uh, I'll give a few examples. Uh, in this case, the uh, the commissioner that uh, conducts all these investigations. He's moved from Elections Canada to the Office of uh, Public Prosecutions. The centralization of an investigative powers it does accord pretty well with the overall thrust this government, which is much more likely to centralize than to decentralize power. So it's not 
really a surprising position for the Tories to take. Uh, sorry, I'm going to go through these, these fairly quickly. Uh, second, this is a, a party and a lead that have a long history of opposing limits on, uh, on what parties and, and citizens can do during election campaigns, what they can do, what they can say, and what they can, uh, what they can spend way back yonder uh, in the unfortunately titled uh, Harper v. Canada. Uh, Stephen Harper, when he was president of the National Citizens Coalition, challenged the Canada Elections Act's limits on third party election advertising. And in fact, the court agreed with Harper that this, uh, this constituted uh, a, a violation of the freedom of expression. They thought it was a reasonable limit under Section 1. But, so this is, this is not a new position uh, uh, that Harper has taken. Uh, this bill empowers parties, it gives parties more power, it also allows citizens to give more. It's in keeping with this tradition that Harper has expressed in the past. Third, the government's uh, preoccupied with fraud, uh, so we can see tougher penalties and measures to address it. We have to see this within the wider context of a strongly law and order party. Uh, at the same time, what's, what's, what's interesting in this case is that the government refused the CEO's request that investigators be allowed to compel cooperation. Uh, that actually supports maybe the second explanation, the, the, the more negative explanation. Uh, but cracking down is something that this government does a lot of, so we shouldn't be surprised to see it here. Uh, and finally, I think the bill is actually a pretty good expression of the long-held conservative belief, and this is, in this respect, it's, they're unique amongst the parties, that parties really are private organizations rather than public utilities, and the relationships that parties have with the state and these different agencies, it should reflect that relationship. And the bill is a good expression of that. So that's the principled argument. Uh, second, we get to the score settling and uh, gerrymandering of the rules argument. Uh, apparently 62% of people polled, uh, Toronto Star poll, thought that this actually was uh, a case of score settling with elections canvas, so that's not good. Uh, although it probably falls along partisan lines to a large extent. Uh, so what kind of evidence can we see? Well, we know that there's been tension between elections canvas and the government, so when the government moves to limit the powers of the CEO, take powers away from the agency, it's natural to see that as a form of score settling. And in fact, the Tories haven't actually done that much to, uh, to prevent that uh, perception. In particular, I think we can point to this provision that, that limits the topics and subjects that the chief electoral officer can speak to publicly. It's a very strange part of the bill. So strange, in fact, that this is, this is one of the few areas where the minister is actually going to go back and amend the bill to make it clear that the bill's talking about promotional advertising. But the perception remains that this is what they were, were getting at. This is one of the few things that they've gone back uh, uh, to change. So it does lend credibility to the view that the Tories uh, were gunning for Maynard in this bill. Um, and we can find some clues that perhaps the Tories are looking to rig the rules. The curtailing of vouching before voting, uh, which I'm sure uh, uh, will be talked about later on. Uh, and, and uh, essentially doing away to a large extent with some of these uh, information campaigns and uh, turnout campaigns. Who will it affect? Uh, both, it'll affect the young, poor, aboriginals, etc., etc., more than others. Just so happens these are the groups, of course, that are least likely to vote for the, uh, for the Conservative Party. So, oh yeah, and the, the increase in spending allowed will uh, benefit the Tories the most because, for the time being, uh, they have the most to spend, and they're the best at raising money. So we can find some evidence this is going to help the Conservative Party, and maybe that's kind of what they're getting at. And finally, I'd like to present a, a third possibility, kind of a middle road. Uh, and what I'd like to argue is that, in fact, the, the Fair Elections Act, it is in keeping with the principles that the Tories have espoused for some time, but they've gone about implementing or pursuing these, uh, these, these goals in such a way as to limit the ability of Elections Canada to, uh, to damage them, and the reason for that is that Elections Canada, in the Tories' view, is they believe deeply and sincerely that this is an organization that actually is out to get them. I don't think you can really understand this bill unless you really, uh, unless you really believe that. So some of you may recall, uh, near the end of the 2006 campaign, uh, Harper was about to win, and uh, so he was going to dampen Fear. People were afraid of a conservative majority, and so the way that he dealt with this was he said, well, yes, we might win a majority. Uh, he didn't. He said, we may have a majority, but luckily the judiciary and the bureaucracy is stacked with liberals, 
Uh, and so they're going to be a, a wonderful check on our power. He got in trouble for that. It was a little kerfuffle. But he, he won anyway. So Harper didn't campaign on issuing pink slips and running shoes to bureaucrats. Uh, Mulroney did that. But the comment is actually pretty indicative of their view of the government and the state and the bureaucracy. And it turns out that there's one agency in particular that catches Tory's eyes in this respect. I, don't, I think that probably most of you can guess which agency that, that is. So here's a quote from a Tory MP that I got to uh, hang out with uh, a lot in the last year. Quote, Liberals have their tentacles in every institution in this country. Elections Canada is the absolute worst. Unquote. And how to deal with them. Quote, You've got to be tough. You've got to be hands-on. The Liberals, they don't play like that. Unquote. What he meant is the Liberals, they're, they're not nice. They actually are tough. The concern, he was saying Harper had not been tough enough. Uh, he needed to be more like a Liberal in dealing with these institutions. And it's probably fair to say that the Fair Elections Act, if, if anything, it actually is pretty, pretty tough uh, that uh, uh, Olivier is taking this advice. Um, I have another quote uh, taken from an interview. Uh, the minister has actually done a, a few interviews. He's talking about uh, partisan appointments uh, at the riding level. Uh, because Elections Canada doesn't have a problem with party-named officials. We know that. How do we know that? Because they renamed dozens of liberal appointed returning officers that were previous order and council nominations from the previous liberal government. He renamed them in the subsequent election after we passed laws in the Accountability Act specifically making these positions nonpartisan. So it's news to me if he suddenly has a problem with partisan nominations. So you can see there actually is this, this, this very negative view of Elections Canada built into uh, how the minister is justifying this particular bill. Now, in fairness, uh, or I shouldn't say that, from the Tory perspective, uh, there's lots of evidence to support the view that Elections Canada is biased against them. Uh, the examples that I heard a lot of relate to Shelley Glover. Uh, uh, with respect to her, she got in trouble for uh, costing her signs improperly. Uh, the view from the party is that the, the agency was absolutely gunning for, for, uh, for Ms. Glover. On the other hand, you have uh, several liberal leadership candidates in the last leadership campaign, and one before that, who haven't paid off their, their leadership debts and apparently have no intention of doing so. Maynard says, and he's right, he doesn't have any powers to deal with that situation, but it doesn't change the perception uh, that Tories hold that this agency will go after them, but not uh, uh, the liberals. So I wouldn't read what I've just said as a, as a defense of the bill, uh, or of the Tories, uh, uh, Though I do think that the Fair Elections Act it is a good expression of the Tories' views on what electoral administration should look like. But you can't really understand the Act, I don't think, if you don't understand where the Tories are coming from in terms of how they see the, uh, the agency. It turns out where they're coming from is not a, uh, not a very pleasant place at all.